Okay, shall we uh, get underway? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's John Davis. I'm director of the Strand Group at King's College London. What a great pleasure it is uh, to be doing this this evening. The Strand Group um, exists uh, to try to understand how government really works through research, through teaching, through training, and tonight through an event. Uh, this is the fourth event of our uh, new, relatively new, uh, Institutions of British Government Research Seminar uh, and is in partnership with the Institute of, of Historical Research uh, and a very big thank you to their director, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Joanne Fox, uh, for helping us with this. Um, so, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Mario Pisani. Mario uh, is currently Deputy Director in the Fiscal Group uh, the HM Treasury. He joined in uh, the Treasury in 2005 and has worked in macroeconomics, international policy, communications, and as private secretary to the Chancellor. But from our point of view this evening, I think much more importantly, he's visiting professor at King's. And through that, that's where I've got to know him, uh, uh, he's been a stalwart of our uh, Treasury postgraduate history class as we uh, got underway about five years ago. We're about to start the sixth uh, at the end of this month. Uh, and it's something that uh, myself and our respondent this evening, uh, Lord McPherson, put together back in the wilds of time. Um, with an increasingly relevant presentation on who finances the financiers, I will waste no more time and handing you over to Professor Pisani. It's all yours, Mario. Uh, thank you, John. That's um, an incredibly um, kind uh, introduction. And I'm really delighted to be able to deliver this talk tonight. Uh, it's, I hope lots of people tune in. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, but before I begin, I would like to say thank you to a couple of people. I am incredibly grateful to Nick McPherson and to you, John, for how you've encouraged me and supported me in researching this topic and preparing this talk. I also want to say thank you to everyone who has helped me with it, whether it be with comments, uh, getting me data, checking my calculations, I'm so grateful, and while I can't name you all tonight, the published version of this paper will include a full list of uh, acknowledgements. I'd like to say a special thanks to Nick Hamill in the Treasury Finance team, as without him and his copies of the Treasury accounts from 20 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to, to do this. My talk tonight is entitled, Who Finances the Financiers? 20 Years of HM Treasury Resource Accounts. In the fifth season of the TV series, The Simpsons, episode 11 sees the town of Springfield struck by a burglar. Among other things, the criminal steals um, Marge's pearl necklace and Lisa's saxophone. Homer decides to start a neighborhood watch group to catch whoever is responsible for the burglaries. Homer being Homer, his group quickly starts abusing their powers and turns into a bunch of vigilantes. Lisa then challenges Homer saying, if you are the police, who will police the police? Lisa's comment can be traced back to the early years of the second century AD and the work of the Roman poet Juvenal. His original face, quis custodiet ipsos custodis, can be translated literally as who will guard the guards themselves and was originally used in a very different context. In its modern usage, the question has become who watches the watchmen? and it's now used to describe the challenge of controlling those in a position of power. Her Majesty's Treasury is the United Kingdom's economic and finance ministry. In the British system of government, the Treasury holds tremendous power, and this power is primarily derived from the Treasury's role in allocating public finance across all government departments. So in this talk, I will try to apply Juvenal's insight to the Treasury itself and ask who finances the financiers. I will answer this question by analyzing the information contained within the Treasury's annual accounts. These accounts allow us to understand the full range of resources available to finance the activities of the Treasury. By this I mean not only the financial resources in the form of funding, expenditure, assets and liabilities, but also human resources, organizational culture and institutional partnerships. It is also a good time to do this as last year marked 20 years since the Treasury started publishing audited resource accounts. My thesis tonight is that the story of the Treasury between 1999 and 2019 
is a tale of significant change coupled with surprising constancy. This uh, lecture is divided into five parts. First, I will talk about what the Treasury is and how it has changed since 1999. Second, I will explain how the Treasury has financed its activities over the past two decades. From this will follow, third, a look at the Treasury's core resource, its people. Fourth, I will examine the huge expansion in the Treasury's balance sheet since the financial crisis. And fifth, I will conclude by looking at the financial relationship between the Treasury and two of its most important institutional partners in finance, the Debt Management Office and the Bank of England. Let me move on to the first part of this talk. I would like to pose a rather straightforward question. What is the Treasury? Please take a second to think about it. And I wonder what image comes to mind. For a lot of people, the Treasury conjures up an image of its current building with its entrance on Horsecars Road, looking onto St. James's Park. But this is not a location that the Treasury has actually occupied for very long. In fact, that side of the building only became the Treasury headquarters in 2002. For many, the Treasury is synonymous with its leadership. On the political front, this means the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak MP. On the official side, the Permanent Secretary, Sir Tom Scholar. But more than a building or a person, the Treasury is a set of ideas. These ideas can be distilled into two central concepts, a common purpose and an organizational structure. And these in turn are the main elements of a coherent institution. I would like to take a few minutes to explore how these two concepts, the Treasury's purpose and the Treasury's structure have evolved over time. Let me start with the Treasury's purpose, the administration of the government's finances. The history of this function can be traced back hundreds of years with the official role of the treasurer or the person charged with administering the monarch's finances reliably appearing in historical records since at least the early Norman period. Since the Middle Ages, the treasury's specific goals have obviously changed hugely over the centuries, but the underlying purpose has remained broadly the same and that has continued over the past 20 years. The first set of resource accounts for the year 1999-2000 set out nine objectives for HM Treasury, which are here on the, on the left. Over the 20 years that followed, the number of objectives decreased to eight in the mid 2000s and then to three or four from 2008 onwards. This table shows a comparison between the nine departmental objectives from 20 years ago and the most recent set of Treasury objectives from 2018-19. While the number of objectives listed and the language used has changed in that time, the substance is remarkably similar. There are some objectives about using tax and spending policies to ensure public finances, they're shaded grey. There are objectives about maintaining macroeconomic and financial stability, they're shaded blue. And there are objectives about increasing productivity and employment, they're shaded orange. In recent years, the annual report on accounts have also included a corporate objective set by the department's management rather than by the ministers, which sets out how the Treasury would like to manage itself as an institution. That's shaded here green. As well as a common purpose, the other thing that defines the Treasury as an institution is its organisational structure. In the period since the end of the Second World War, the Treasury has seen recurring institutional reform. The annual accounts show that continuing in the last 20 years. One way that we can see this is by looking at the basis on which the accounts are consolidated each year. The thing to realize is that the accounts are not really about the treasury, but about the treasury group. The treasury group is the parent entity comprising so-called core treasury or the main department, which most people think about when they think of the treasury, as well as a range of other agencies and arm's length bodies. In 1999-2000, the Treasury Group was relatively simple. It was made up of just two organisations, the Treasury and the Debt Management Office. As this chart shows, the number of entities within the Treasury Group has expanded significantly since 1999. In last year's accounts, there were 19 different public bodies within the Treasury Group, just below the peak two years earlier. Some of this large expansion is because of the government-wide effort to improve alignment in financial reporting, which took place around 2011-12. On top of that, many new entities have been created within the Treasury Group for a specific policy or delivery purposes. 
and there's been a number of functional transfers where a unit of function has transferred in and out of the treasury, often as a result of machinery of government changes. For example, when the prime minister's delivery unit moved into the treasury in 2007, or when pensions wise moved out of the treasury in 2016. This is what the treasury group looks like today in the latest set of accounts. And you can see that it includes a real mix of organizations with a surprising range of functions covered. As set out here, the 19 entities can be classified into two categories, core treasury and agencies, and then the wider set of arm's length bodies. Some of these have a specific functions that are expected to remain part of the institutional architecture for the foreseeable future, such as the Office for Budget Responsibility, which is responsible for forecasting, or the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, which is responsible for compensating bank depositors. But others are expected to have more time-limited functions, such as, for example, UK Asset Resolution, which was set up to hold legacy banking assets acquired during the crisis. So let me come back to the question of what is the Treasury? It seems clear that the Treasury's aim has remained remarkably constant, not only over the past 20 years, but for decades before that. It is the Treasury's organizational structure, which has seen almost continuous evolution. The Treasury group of today, with its different agencies, bodies, and government companies, would seem almost unrecognizable to the Treasury official of 20 years ago. I would now like to turn to the second part of this talk and look at the question of how the Treasury has financed its operations over the past 20 years. This should, um, this should be a simple uh, enough question to answer, but it is not simple. Principally because there is no published time series which shows the amount of funding that the Treasury has received each year for the past 20 years. You may find that surprising, but there are good reasons why. As we just saw, the Treasury Group as a set of institutions has changed significantly since the late 1990s. The way in which departmental budgets are measured has also changed in that time. And at various points in the past two decades, there have been large one-off receipts and expenditures which have distorted the Treasury's budget. Because of all these challenges, it is only by using 20 years of published accounts that it is possible to show how the Treasury has financed itself between 1999 and 2019. It is worth clarifying up front the difference between how the Treasury itself is financed and how the Treasury finances the whole of government. While institutionally and operationally, the Treasury has full control of the exchequer, these days we use that term to refer to the central funds that are used to manage the flow of government revenue and expenditure. In accounting terms, they're separate. So while the Treasury is the financier in the sense that they can decide how funds are allocated across government, the funds themselves do not flow through the Treasury's accounts, but through the accounts of a number of central funds, such as the National Loans Fund and Consolidated Fund. So what about the Treasury's funding? The starting point, the place where most people would look first, is the annual Treasury publication called Public Expenditure St Statistical Analyses. This is a very rich publication with lots of information regarding public spending. And one way it presents information is according to the so-called budgeting framework, or in other words, data on each department's resource and capital budgets. These are the funds which were originally set out by the Treasury as part of a spending review process. They were then voted on and approved by Parliament in the usual supply process and were then spent by each department. Indeed, this way one can see recent data on the Treasury's expenditure. The problem is that prior to 2016, a different definition was used and HM Treasury was included as part of the so-called Chancellor's Departments, which included not only the Treasury, but HM Revenue and Customs and National Savings and Investments. So this only provides us with an incomplete picture of the last 20 years. An alternative source would have been uh, past spending review publications, but the problem with that approach is that the data would have been based on planned expenditure rather than actual outturn. And that's why instead, one has to use the Treasury's annual resource accounts because each year's publication sets out the actual expenditure incurred in the preceding year. As shown in this table, in 1999-2000, the Treasury's resource spending was uh, 266 million, and then 274 million 
and 235 million in the two years that followed. It was around this time that the budgeting regime changed to differentiate between two different types of public spending, the so-called Dell and Amy. Uh, let me uh, explain for those not familiar with it, with, with my friends Dell and Amy. Dell stands for, and I've set it out there at the bottom of the slide, Departmental Expenditure Limit. Uh, and that covers all administration and program spending, which can be reasonably controlled. And AMI stands for annually managed expenditure, which is spending that is less predictable and controllable. From 2002, three onwards, the Treasury's resource budget is reported using this split. This shows that up to 2007, eight, the Treasury spell spending ranges between 167 million and 212 million pounds while the AMI budget ranges between 24 and 192 million. Uh, the capital budget is small compared to the resource budget. Uh, I'm not showing it here, with the exception of the Treasury's uh, decision to refurbish its building and relocate headquarters using a 35-year PFI contract. It is after the financial crisis uh, of 2008-9 that things get complicated. Just, I'm getting a message in my screen. I'm just going to... Okay. As the table shows, from that point onwards, the Treasury's budget becomes um, a lot larger and more volatile. This is particularly the case for the Amy budget, which increases from millions to billions. You can see the big increase there at the bottom of the table, and ranges between 42 billion in 089 and it goes as far the other way to minus 49 billion, so that's negative expenditure in 2014-15. I have not shown it here, but the capital AMI budget also expands dramatically after 2008-9. Uh, in fact, it's quite interesting, as recently as 2006-7, the annual accounts declared, and I quote, that the HMT group has no capital AMI. Only two years later, in 2008-9, capital AMI spending reached 85 billion pounds. The reason for these huge increases in spending are apparent. They are the consequence of the financial stability interventions that the Treasury took during the financial crisis. These interventions included, among other things, the purchase of shares in large UK banks, the provision of loans to firms in distress, and in some cases, outright nationalization. This means that from that point onwards, the biggest single item in each year's accounts involve assistance to financial institutions of financial stability interventions. Now, a proper dissection of the public finance implications of the banking crisis is beyond the scope of my talk tonight, but it is a really fascinating topic which others have um, tackled with great insight, like the, the OBR. And for the aficionados, I can recommend a, a lot of the detail that is set out in the successive annual report on accounts from 2008 onwards. So how can we extract, abstract from these distortions? Looking at the Treasury's Dell spending in isolation does show a less volatile picture than if you look at Dell and Amy, but it's not completely free of distortions. For example, between 2012 and 14, the Treasury recorded significant negative spending within Dell, primarily due to income from the misconduct fines imposed in the wake of the LIBOR and FX scandals. So across both Amy and Dell, there's a little bit too much noise in the data to be able to answer the question of how the Treasury has funded itself rather than how it's funded its policies. But there is a way. The annual accounts also set out each year how much of the Treasury spending uh, went on so-called administration costs. This is defined as the cost of running a central government department that do not relate to the delivery of frontline services. It is primarily made up of pay for the department's civil servants, as well as accommodation and other admin expenses. It is therefore the closest thing to something that will help us understand how the Treasury has financed itself. Uh, this chart here shows administration costs for HM Treasury between 1999 and 2019. In the paper, I, have, I also have the, the data for the, both the Treasury Group and Core Treasury. This is just um, Core Treasury. With the exception of 2002-03, when the costs increased as a result of the PFI contract on the Treasury building, which I mentioned earlier, Administration costs for core treasury have never exceeded 150 million pounds per year. And most frequently, these costs have come in somewhere between 100 million and 130 million per year. 
The key point here is that administration costs are remarkably less volatile than the wider definitions of treasury spending in Dell or Amy, because it takes out the financial impact of the treasury's various policies over time. We can also see how the treasury's administration budget compares with growth in the wider public sector and the economy. Uh, the answer is it compares pretty favorably. I'll set out in this table the increasing administration costs between 1999 and 2019 was equivalent to total growth of 79%, which equates to average annual growth of 3.1% per year. In the wider public sector over the same period, total managed expenditure grew by 127% or 4.4 per year. Over the same 20 year period, period nominal GDP grew by 3.8% per year on average. So another way that you can present this is by deflating core treasury admin costs and calculate the real terms growth rate. And that shows that um, the treasury's administration costs grew by an average of uh, just 1.1% per year on average. So to bring this section together and answer the question of how the treasury has financed its operations in the last two decades, we do this by looking through the vagaries and distortions inherent in the reporting of public spending. And we do that by focusing on the Treasury's administration costs. My main insight is that despite the long time period covered, how much the Treasury has evolved as an institution and the policy interventions undertaken, there's a remarkable degree of constancy when it comes to the cost of running the Treasury. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the Treasury has been quite good at keeping costs down. Now let's move on to the next part of my talk. As Nick McPherson said in his excellent lecture, The Origins of Treasury Control, the Treasury is only as effective as the people within it. So in this section, I want to look at the Treasury's, at what the Treasury's accounts tell us about the organization's biggest cost driver, its people. Just to put it into context, let's take the most recent year as an example. In 2018-19, staff costs at core treasury amounted to 125 million pounds and that is out of a total net administration costs of 150 million pounds as this table shows the number of people employed has fluctuated over the years in most years staff numbers have ranged between 1100 and 1300 staff in the earlier years 1999 to 2002 there was a smaller treasury with fewer staff in recent years and during the financial crisis, the number of employees has grown higher as a result of the significant pressures placed on a department with significant policy challenges. The annual accounts also have data on the Treasury's senior civil servants, which is available for most of the past 10 years. Again, we see a remarkable degree of stability with the senior civil service at the Treasury ranging between 90 and 120 members. In recent years, there's been some who've questioned whether the proportion of senior to total staff is appropriate for the department with such critical central responsibilities as HM Treasury. Another very interesting insight from the annual accounts is the data on staff turnover. This is a well-known Treasury issue. It became especially prominent in 2012 when the then Director General Sharon White undertook a review of the Treasury's response to the crisis. She identified high staff turnover as one of the organizational challenges affecting the Treasury's management of the financial crisis. In the run-up to the crisis, the turnover rate had fluctuated around 25%, then peaking at 38% in 2008. Since then, in the past 10 years, staff turnover at Treasury, as recorded in the, in the annual accounts, has ranged between 21 and 25%, with the exception of a low point in 2015-16, when it dropped to 13%. While lower than pre-crisis, the turnover rate is still relatively high by Whitehall standards and the source of some concern among commentators who believe it may lead to higher costs and inefficiencies. Now, a lot of people leave the Treasury each year, for sure, but they are not all leaving because they do not enjoy it there. In fact, if you look at these images that I put up a minute ago of Treasury staff, which I got from Google Images, by the way, um, everyone to me looks relatively happy. Um, now, the annual accounts also report key results from the annual civil service wide people survey. This is a huge effort first launched in 2009 and which in recent years has seen over 300,000 civil servants take part. The main metric that people look at is the so-called employee engagement index. 
this is an aggregate measure measured to, to get that uh, job satisfaction. And for the civil, civil service as a whole, the median departmental engagement score ranges between 56 and 62%. For the treasury, the employee engagement score has ranged between 65 and 75%. And as shown in this table, the treasury has consistently been among the top three most engaged departments. And in the last five years, it has also been the top scoring main department when it comes to employee engagement. So what do the accounts tell us about the Treasury's people? The department is relatively small by Whitehall standards. It's total staff averaging around 1,100 people in the past 20 years. Since 1999, the total number of people employed at the Treasury has grown with peaks around the financial crisis of 2008 and following the vote to leave the European Union in 2016. Turnover is still relatively high, but the annual survey shows that the Treasury staff are engaged and positive about their work. Moving on, finance is about flows, so resources in and expenses out, but it's also about stocks, assets and liabilities. So in the fourth part of this lecture, I want to look at what the Treasury's annual accounts tell us about the Treasury's balance sheet. Again, this is a story of two halves, before and after the financial crisis of 2008. This can clearly be seen in this chart, which shows the Treasury's assets, liabilities, and the difference between the two, the so-called net assets or taxpayers' equity. In fact, it's, it's actually quite hard to see what's going on on, on the first, on the one half of the chart there on the left. And that is because the, the balance sheet expanded so much following 2008 that the plot of the data in the earlier years really looks minuscule and com compared to the, to the latter years. So what I've done is that I've broken it up into two, two halves so you can see it more easily. So this chart here shows the first period or the years between 1999 and 2007. And the Treasury's balance sheet in those years is rather unremarkable. On average, the Treasury Group held assets of between one and a half and two billion pounds. The largest subcategory was investments, which made up between three quarters and 95% of total assets. And within investments, the single biggest item was the Treasury's ownership of the Bank of England. On the other side of the balance sheet, liabilities range between 100 and 400 million per year, with the largest subcategory being uh, trade payables. The resultant uh, net asset balance fluctuates around one and a half billion. It is from 2007-8 that the balance sheet uh, changes considerably. This chart shows the Treasury Group's assets uh, increasing dramatically in the space of three years reaching over a hundred billion pounds by 2009-10. The increase in liabilities is less marked, peaking twice above 30 billion, but more frequently ranging below 10 billion pounds. Looking first at the assets side of the balance sheet, I've done um, a breakdown of the subcategories of assets. We can see that the changes are over overwhelmingly driven by the financial stability interventions that took place during the financial crisis. This can be seen by looking at the two largest asset classes. The first is financial assets, um, which is the orange series in the bar chart. And it's at this peak in 2009-10, this category of assets amounted to 65 billion pounds. This was primarily made up of holdings of uh, shares in the bank uh, that were recapitalized in 2008, some 60 billion pounds of shares in the Royal Bank of Scotland and Lloyds Banking Group as well as holdings in the fully nationalized entities, Northern Rock and Bradford and Bingley. Since the peak in 2009-10, uh, HMT has disposed of many of these financial assets with the latest set of accounts showing holdings of 24 and a half billion. The second category that we can see here is uh, loans and advances. In 9-10, this category amounted to 57.5 billion pounds with the vast majority accounted for by loans to Northern Rock, Bradford and Bingley, Dunfermline Building Society and various Icelandic financial institutions operating in the UK. Loans peaked in 2013-14 at 68 billion following the consolidation into the Treasury Group of UK Asset Resolution. As I mentioned earlier, the holding company tasked with the disposal of legacy assets from the crisis. There were also additional loans to other financial institutions and the bilateral loan to Ireland during the European sovereign debt crisis. Since then, loans have reduced considerably 
to just nine billion pounds in the latest set of accounts for the year 1819. There's a third asset class in most years smaller than the other two, but considerable in size and derivative financial assets. Just to explain an apology, the derivative financial asset is based on a financial instrument which is settled in the future, whose value is a function of an underlying item. And I've labeled them here just as derivatives in, in dark blue. This category has fluctuated significantly since 089 from less than 500 million to as much as 51 billion pounds in 2016-17. Over the years, there have been a number of items within this category, but the vast majority is accounted for by the impact of the Bank of England's policy of quantitative easing, which is 100% indemnified by HM Treasury. For example, in the latest set of accounts, the single item uh, for the Bank of England QE policy accounted for 45 billion pounds. And because since the financial crisis, many loans have been repaid and shares have been sold, this derivative is now the single biggest item on the Treasury's balance sheet. And I will be saying a bit more about the relationship between the bank and the Treasury in the following section. Here's a chart of um, the Treasury's liabilities. So I've just broken down the liabilities, which are mostly made up of uh, provisions, uh, to, including a provision created during the financial crisis for the asset protection scheme and a few other items. Um, but really most of the interesting stuff in the balance sheet is on the asset side. So just to summarize this section, what do 20 years of treasury resource accounts tell us about their balance sheet? I would say there are three key insights. First, the size of the balance sheet has increased significantly after 2007-8. Second, the large increase in assets and liabilities was overwhelmingly driven by the financial stability interventions during the financial crisis. And third, even recently, while the balance sheet is gradually getting smaller, it is still large with the single largest asset being the derivative resulting from the Bank of England's policy of quantitative easing. Um, let us stay with the bank because in the fifth part of this talk, I would like to talk about two other institutions, which alongside HM Treasury can be considered to be financiers in the public sector. The UK Debt Management Office or DMO and the Bank of England. Both institutions are important partners to HM Treasury. They both also have extremely interesting histories. In fact, before 1997, their history is a common one because before then the bank was responsible for managing the government's debt. So today, I will only really scratch the surface and focus specifically on how these organizations are financed and their links to the Treasury. Let us start with the DMO. The DMO is an executive agency of HM Treasury. Its main responsibility is for raising finance for government by conducting operations in sterling wholesale markets and managing the Exchequer's daily cash management requirements. The proposal for creating a debt management agency was announced in 1997. In the first few days after the Labour government was elected, the Chancellor Gordon Brown surprised commentators by granting the Bank of England operational independence for setting interest rates. The details were set out in a letter from Gordon Brown to the then bank governor, Eddie George, in May 1997. But the letter also included another much less publicised but very important announcement. I have, I have pulled out the key quote from the letter here regarding the bank's role as the government's agent for debt management role that was taken away from the bank and given back to the Treasury or given to the Treasury. Consultation and legislation followed and the DMO was established on the 1st of April 1998. As we saw earlier, the DMO is the only organization which has been part of the Treasury group every year for the past 20 years. The DMO are a crucial part of HM Treasury. As we all know, the government cannot always fund its expenditure from its receipts. In fact, the UK has only achieved a budget surplus in three of the last 30 years. This means that the government has to borrow. In recent years, it's had to borrow quite a lot. And the DMO is in charge of operationalizing such borrowing from investors and for managing the government's wholesale debt portfolio. The DMO is led by the Chief Executive Officer, Sir Robert Steeman. He is employed by HM Treasury as a member of the Senior Civil Service, where he reports to the Treasury's Permanent Secretary. Ministerial responsibility for the DMO and for debt management policy rests with one of the Treasury's ministers, currently the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, John Glenn, MP. The DMO's own finances are relatively straightforward. 
They are financed from within the Treasury Group's own resource budget, which I discussed earlier. The DMO's budget can be split into administration and program costs. And like the Treasury, the bigger of the two is administration costs, which covers staff salaries, accommodation, and other business related activities. It also covers technology, which is an important cost driver as the DMO is largely self-sufficient in terms of maintaining its financial markets and trading systems. As shown in this table, the, these costs have most frequently ranged between seven and 14 million pounds a year. As a reminder, we saw earlier that uh, for the past 20 years, the Treasury's administration costs were between 120 and 170 million pounds. As with the core treasury, staff are the main cost driver for the DMO. And looking at their staffing levels, we see an increase from around 35 full-time staff in the equivalent in the early years to over 100 in recent years. One important difference on staffing between the treasury and the DMO is that the DMO tends to employ a greater percentage of the staff on a non-permanent basis. And this is to do with their technology and IT requirements. The increase in DMO staffing levels over the past 20 years needs to be set against the large increase in terms of the DMO's activities. The GILT program, or the borrowing that the DMO does on behalf of the government from the markets, has increased in those 20 years more than fivefold, while the cash management turnover has increased tenfold. So an interesting calculation that I've done here involves looking at the administration cost of raising one million pounds through the GILT program, and this has fallen significantly from 315 pounds per million at the start of the period to 115 pounds per million at the end of the period, which is impressive. Now, turning to the Bank of England. The bank was established in 1694 in the period known as the English Financial Revolution. The original concept was based on the idea of a private bank whose main business would be to lend money to the government. The funds were needed urgently to finance the war against France and a deal was struck, a large loan for the government and a secure income stream from the bank. This meant that the government and the bank had locked themselves into an enduring relationship. And indeed, the links between the bank and the treasury were reinforced even further following the nationalization of the Bank of England in 1946. To this day, ancient treasury is the sole shareholder of the bank and treasury ministers appoint the governor, deputy governors, and all independent members of the bank's court, or that's a name they give to their board. This means that the Treasury has a number of different perspectives on the bank. The Treasury owns all of the bank's capital, so it stands behind the institution should it experience severe financial losses and also benefits when the bank generates a profit. The two institutions are policy partners when it comes to macroeconomic or financial sector policies. The Treasury also acts as the legislative and governance sponsor for the bank. And the Treasury is also a customer for some of the services provided by the bank. The bank is financed through a combination of different mechanisms. First, there is the bank's policy functions or the areas working on financial stability and monetary policy. They are funded through the so-called cash ratio deposit scheme. This scheme mandates banks and building societies to place interest-free deposits at the Bank of England, which then get invested and generate income that the bank keeps. The legal powers which require private sector banks to take part in this scheme are approved and legislated by the Treasury. Second, the, the costs incurred by the Prudential Regulation Authority, which is now a subsidiary entity of the Bank of England, as well as the costs relating to supervising financial markets infrastructure, are recovered by a, a levy on the financial services industry, which again, the powers to impose it stem from government legislation overseen by the Treasury. Third, the bank recovers any costs incurred in the provision of its remunerated activities. These include banking services, lending operations, and other services, which are supplied to both private sector and public sector customers. And one of the public sector customers is the treasury itself, which for example, pays the bank for the management of the government's foreign currency reserves. Fourth, a, there is a production of banknotes. The cost of producing physical cash, both banknotes and coins, is only a tiny fraction of its face value. So the process results in a significant income stream known as seniorage. From the seniorage, the bank deducts the cost incurred in the production of banknotes and then pays the remainder into the exchequer. Finally, the bank's market transactions undertaken for policy reasons can also generate income. So we can see that 
Unlike the Treasury, the bank is not funded through the parliamentary supply process. However, across four of these sources of income for the bank, the cash ratio deposit scheme, the industry levy, the remunerated activities and banknote production, there is a very strong link between HM Treasury and the bank. It is thanks to the Treasury's legislative powers that the bank is able to charge the private sector for its activities. This means that while the bank may not be funded through the usual public spending process, it is nonetheless funded with public money. If we look at the two institutions' balance sheets, we also see a strong link between the Treasury and the bank. As we saw earlier, this is the same chart I showed earlier about the Treasury's assets um, following the financial crisis. In the years before the financial crisis, the Treasury's single biggest balance sheet, balance sheet item was its ownership of capital in the Bank of England. This asset is valued on the Treasury's books as the bank's net assets, or the difference between the bank's assets and liabilities. It grew from 1.3 billion in 1999 to 5.5 billion in 2019, and that follows the Treasury's one-off injection of capital into the bank, which took place last year. Since the financial crisis, as we saw earlier, the Treasury's balance sheet has expanded significantly. And in the latest year, the biggest item is the derivative created by the bank's policy of quantitative easing. The policy was first introduced in 2009, and it involves the purchase of financial assets funded through the creation of central bank money. As of March 2019, the bank held some 444 billion of assets purchased in this way. The assets are held by a subsidiary of the bank, and their valuation on the accounts fluctuates as the market value of the assets moves up and down. Because of the large scale of these asset purchases relative to the bank's own capital base, the Treasury provides a full indemnity against any losses. And because ultimately the Treasury is the entity holding the underlying risk, the net value of these various financial instruments is recognised on the Treasury's own accounts as a derivative. So looking at the balance sheets over the past 20 years, again tells a story with a lot of change, but some continuity for both in 1999 and in 2019, the largest item on the Treasury's balance sheet involved the Bank of England or its policies. A recurring theme of this talk is that economic policy institutions tend to spend a significant proportion of their budget on staff costs. So I want to say a bit about the bank here, as it was true for the Treasury and the DMO. The number of people employed at the bank has fluctuated over the decades in line with the bank's remit. So while staff numbers were around 2,500 in 1999 and around 4,400 in 2019, over that, the, that time, the bank's mandate has changed significantly. In, particularly, in particular, in the late 1990s, the creation of the Financial Services Authority uh, led to some staff being transferred out of the bank and in the mid-2010s, the creation of the Prudential Regulation Authority resulted in a large transfer of staff back in. Over the past 20 years, the bank's expenditure budget has increased from 207 million in 1999 to 646 million in 2018-19. So to summarize this section, the history of the Treasury is a story about managing Britain's public finances and national debt. And as well as the Treasury, that story features the Bank of England and in recent years, the Debt Management Office. The relationship between these three institutions is crucial to understanding the financial history of the Treasury over the past 20 years. This applies to their incomes and expenditures, as well as the human and financial capital. So I would now like to conclude. Going back to the beginning of this lecture and Lisa Simpson's question, if you are the police, who will police the police? Homer replies in typical fashion, I don't know, Coast Guard? It sounds slightly ridiculous that the answer to the question of who should watch the police should be a complete, completely different public order institution. But curiously, if we were to instead ask who finances the financiers, the simple answer is Parliament, a completely different public institution. Of course, the most sophisticated answer is that while Parliament votes, to supply the funds that Treasury needs, it is the Treasury itself who ensures that these funds are appropriate. Crucially, my argument tonight is that the Treasury has done a good job of this. The administration budget, the closest thing to the cost of running the Treasury as a department, has grown by just around 3% a year on average since 1999, or 1% 1 a year after adjusting for inflation. This is a slower rate of growth than seen across the wider public sector or the economy as a whole. 
But in answering the question of who finances the financiers and looking at 20 years of treasury resource accounts, I hope to have also been able to provide a few other insights of interest. First, as an institution, the treasury has retained the central purpose of managing the public finances, but its organizational structure has changed significantly and the treasury group of today is much broader than 20 years ago. Second, just as the cost of running the treasury has increased only modestly, staff numbers have not fluctuated hugely. While in the late 1990s, the treasury had a staff of just below 1,000, in most years since, the number of employees has ranged between 1,100 and 1,300. And the evidence shows that staff engagement and turnover also, also point to strong institutional culture. Third, the realization that the treasury's policies are separate to its operations have involved significant financial flows, primarily as a result of the global financial crisis of 2008. The crisis saw huge amounts of public expenditure channeled via the treasury to support the financial sector. And the corollary of this spending was the massive increase in the treasury's balance sheet. Indeed, in terms of the treasury's finances, the 2008 crisis stands out as the single most salient event of the past 20 years. The crisis represented a turning point in the relationship between the financial sector and the state. It came at the apogee of the era of self and light touch regulation. And there is now a clear recognition, it seems to me, that the Treasury is the ultimate guarantor of the financial system as the only institution that can balance the interests of the taxpayer and the banking sector across multiple generations. This is a fascinating theme that I'm sure many others will explore better than I can. Fourth, we have learned something about two other institutions which, alongside the Treasury, can be considered public sector suppliers of finance, the Debt Management Office and the Bank of England. Finally, we can ask, where are the Treasury's accounts heading to in years to come? Nick might say more about this. I expect this month we'll see the publication of the next set of annual accounts for the financial year 2019-20. Some things will not change, other things will. The expansion of the bank's QE program in March will ensure that that remains the Treasury's largest balance sheet item. I expect the new accounts will show a continuation of the winding down of the assets acquired during the 2008-09 crisis. But just as the legacy of the financial crisis begins to fade, other developments will begin to have their own impact on the Treasury's accounts. So I expect new liabilities will have been incurred in relation to the financial settlement required to achieve exit from the European Union. I also expect that the accounts will begin to show the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. In many ways, the impact of these events will differ hugely from what we have seen in the past 20 years. In other ways, it will be the same. The largest public spending schemes will not be visible in the Treasury's accounts, but in those of other government departments. The size and complexity of the Treasury's balance sheet will increase, and there will continue to be a key role for the DMO and the Bank of England working alongside the Treasury. But all of that is for another lecture, sometime in the future. In thinking about who finances the financiers and the evolution of the Treasury over the past 20 years, I hope to have revealed to you all a tale of significant change coupled with surprising constancy. I hope that in 20 years from now, an equally interesting story will be told through the analysis of the Treasury's resource accounts. Thank you. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, already, I can't wait for the next one. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to hand over to the respondent in just a second. If you've got questions, uh, do um, write them on the Q&A tab. Uh, but apart from that, right now, I'm going to hand over to visiting Professor McPherson. Nick, your thoughts. Uh, John, uh, thank you. And Mario, well done. Anybody who can, uh, who can make sense of the Treasury's accounts every year um, has done extremely well. And um, I'd just like to comment on a, on a few themes from my perspective as someone who had the um, misfortune or maybe good fortune of signing off those accounts um, over a 12-year period. Um, and the first point I'd make is that if you're in the Treasury, you're always, you're always hankering after a world where you can simplify the organization. Um, Mario sort of showed this story of ever more bodies being accumulated in the Treasury. But actually, um, you know, if you work in the Treasury, you kind of want to be, be rid of all these bodies and uh, return 
to the Treasury's core function, which is the nation's uh, finance and economics ministry. But events always get in the way. And um, I mean, Mario highlighted the late 1990s, which was definitely the point where the Treasury became smallest in terms of um, its number of uh, number of uh, officials. Um, and that indeed followed one of those periodic reviews, which happened once every 10 to 20 years. Um, but definitely the late 90s were uh, the trough, I think, in the number of Treasury employees in the post-war period. And, um, and what people tend to forget is it wasn't really, um, it didn't get that small, so small by design. A lot of it uh, was uh, a reflection of the very high staff turnover, which has always bedeviled the Treasury, and the complete failure to recruit anybody. So I think in the late 90s, we really recruited very few people indeed. And so therefore, we had to put that right. And I think in, in, in the year 2000, we, we recruited 100 people from, from universities. The other thing, coming back to the coherence of, of the Treasury as an organization, it, I mean, it is pretty incoherent when it comes to, um, you know, what's within the Treasury's perimeter and what's not. So, you know, the Debt Management Office is part of the Treasury. National savings and investments, as it's now called, you know, is is a department, it's a non-ministerial department. So that's outside the perimeter, even though its function is pretty much identical to DMO. It's about raising uh, money. Similarly, it's quite strange that the Bank of England is consolidated into the Treasury's accounts, but the reserves which the bank manages on the Treasury's behalf live in some separate account somewhere else. I mean, the point I'm making here is that, you know, it's, it's no wonder that Mario's had to give this lecture because um, it's virtually impossible to understand um, how these structures fit together. Now, um, strange that it may be to say it, um, accounts do matter and um, uh, the move to resource accounting was a major step forward up until the late 90s. For the last 150 years, we'd been using Gladstonian accounting systems where cash was king. Um, one of my regrets is that I've never managed to get anybody, uh, apart from the Public Accounts Committee, once a year remotely interested in um, the uh, resource accounts. And even even the Financial Times, when Chris Giles gives his latest update on where public borrowing is going, he is totally focused on cash and what used to be known as the PSBR and um, the funding um, challenge. But mentioning funding makes me want to give a big plug to the Debt Management Office. This um, is the most extraordinarily efficient organisation in the public sector. Strangely, um, heads of the civil service and uh, those sort of here today, gone tomorrow, cabinet office ministers who are obsessed with efficiency never seem very interested in mentioning it in dispatches, but they should. Because as Mario points out, and it's not down to the DMO, it's down to, um, down to the British people who've, who've elected governments who want to borrow on an extraordinary scale. Um, the DMO has financed more debt um, since the turn of the century than all previous governments put together. And um, that is quite a um, frightening number, but they do a fantastic job. Um, there are um, real economies of scale in terms of how the DMO um, carries out its activities. But I should also give an honourable mention to my old friends at the Bank of England. I mean, Mario says that I mean, he's pointed out that the Bank of England actually is quite expensive compared to Treasury, um, and certainly it's got a lot more expensive over the last 20 years as it has expanded. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, it's good, it, it, it's good to have it consol consolidated in the Treasury's accounts, and the Treasury occasionally is a beneficiary of um, the um, monopoly profits which the bank extracts from uh, the banking 
system. I should declare my interest. I I chair a small bank, so I'm 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 also aware of how the bank is funded. But um, it's it is um, I think uh, fair to say though that um, just to finish on a on a current subject, the. The, one of the facts which Mario interested me certainly in was the size of the derivative, which is the current value of QE to um, the taxpayer. Um, the point being that um, that so far, because interest rates have got lower and lower and lower, um, the Treasury has tended to benefit from QE. That that can't go on forever. And, um, you know, just as that derivative at the present time is valued in a nice big positive number running to tens of billions of pounds, that could change. And um, I think one of the really interesting subjects for the future, um, not just from the point of view of the Treasury's accounts, is the unwinding of, of QE and the impact it has on the public sector's balance sheet. Anyway, that's enough from me. And I can see my old friend... Ed Balls traveling along in a um, in in the back of a taxi. So I'm hoping he is going to make a contribution at this point. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nick. Um, well, yes, uh, 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 Professor Balls, um, <laughs> would you like to would you like to contribute? Well, it is the um, the nature of the modern world um, during this pandemic and its aftermath. Um, with the huge advantage of Zoom, that you can end up being in an important and erudite uh, seminar from the most unusual of places, including in the back of a car driving through Ealing. So, um, so here I am, and I was so keen to be uh, in at the beginning of the seminar, and unfortunately. Um, We'll give him ten seconds. The thing about Zoom is you can see what's been discussed by watching the recording and by the incoming government and some of them of which were driven by um, to get things onto the agenda. So, sorry? It's probably, uh, it's probably difficult. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? Uh, no, not really. It's, uh, it, it's a bit difficult. It, I think what we'll do, it may we'll come, be that... Uh, I think we'll come back to you in just... In just we'll come... We'll come. We'll come back to you after a first question. We'll come back to you after the first question. Uh, a signal okay. bar. Shall I keep going? Oh, I'm sorry, John. I, I'm in the back of a car, so if it be. Okay. <laughs> I know. I know. I okay. Know. Um, it's no problem. Um, no, it seems to be better. Why don't you try it again? Try it again, and then if not, I'll uh, I'll pass on to another question. So I will um, say a few words now, and you can tell me if you can hear it. You can. So I was saying that I was apologizing for not being at the beginning of Mario's um, contribution tonight, although um, I was there at the beginning of the whole of government accounts reform back at the, um, what is now uh, well over um, 20 years ago. Uh, can you still hear me, John? Yeah, fine. Am I clear? Great. And um, when we came into government in 1997, there were some reformers we came in with a clear view about, and there were some which I think the Treasury decided to take the opportunity of a potentially reforming government with a large majority to um, to drive forward. So, uh, you know, things like Bank of England independence or the, the move towards a current capital split in fiscal accounting or multi-year spending reviews, those are things which have been set out by Labour pre-1997. As you will know, the advent of the Debt Management Office was something injected into our thinking by Gus O'Donnell 24 hours before the general election in 1997, much to the annoyance of the 
Bank of England. Um, one other thing which we had initiated, and I had long conversations with Andrew Lickerman pre the 97 election, was we wanted to make sure that we were using all of the government's capital assets well. And we suggested the drawing up of a national asset register, which was a bit of an obsession of Gordon Brown. I'm not fully sure where that came from, but it threw up um, in the first year of the government some interesting facts, such as the fact that the British government owned Ipswich Town's football, uh, uh, Ipswich Town Football Club's car park and a racing stud somewhere in the south of England and a number of other other things. Um, but I think one of the th other things which was injected into this was two things. Um, one, a focus on long-term fiscal planning and projections. And we were persuaded that we ought to have an element of the budget process, which was asking the question 30, 40 years out, is our fiscal planning um, affordable, taking that very long-term view. And then the other thing was whole of government accounts and the, the move towards thinking more carefully about how we manage capital assets and how um, we thought about resource budgeting. And, uh, you know, I don't think this was something which, let's be honest, had ever been particularly salient in British political debates. And I'm not sure whether Tony Blair or Gordon Brown would ever have used the phrase whole of government accounts, other than Gordon using it in a one of those kind of lengthy elements of his budget statement when he was trying to um, destabilize the, the opposition. But it was something which we began and has carried on since. And I think um, that, that, you know, the civil service is sometimes very good at seeing an opportunity and taking it. And Mario and his team saw that opportunity back then. And 20 years on, we've made huge progress in the the way in which I think the government nationally and locally manages capital assets and thinks about sustainability and um, so I'm very happy for the new Labour government in 97 to take the credit for Bank of England independence and the fiscal rules the whole of government accounts absolutely not other than to facilitate Mario's genius and his team's insight and the fact that 20 years on, we're talking about this as an important reform, which has more road to run, is um, something of great, uh, great significance. And to the extent that any of the credit rubs on us, on us we'll take it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ed. Um, it is remarkable uh, in the history of Labour economic policy making how much of it gets done in the back of a taxi, right? Um, anyway, uh, let's move on. That, by, the way, uh, by, the way, by the way, John, that was not true about the five tests, but there we are. Well, um, <laughs> okay, um, questions are starting to come through. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, ask the first one from uh, Robert Choate, who asks, uh, and I quote, the relative transparency of the methods used to finance the Bank of England and the Treasury's administration costs encourages the former to employ too many people and pay them too much, and the latter to employ too few people and to pay them too little, unquote. Discuss, question mark. Mario. Great, great question from Robert. Thanks also very much to, to Nick and Ed for, for your responses. Um, I mean, I, I, it was hard enough to go through 20 years of treasury accounts and work out all the moving parts and try to come up with something that was vaguely comparable over the, the time period. And that is when you think that really, you know, there's some sources of income here and there, but most of the treasury's funding comes from the supply process. Yeah, I don't, wouldn't like to think how much harder it would be to do that for the bank. I mean, I have read some sets of banks, uh, annual accounts, and it's partly because all the very many sources of income that they have um, and also, you know, because of the return they make on their own assets held, um, you know, it's quite complex. I would say that, on, you know, there, there's something in your question that, you know, the Treasury's accounts now are very transparent. I mean, the first set of accounts from 1999, 2000, of which there aren't many copies, there's, there's, they're not online, are only about 35 pages. The latest set of accounts for the Treasury, they're over 200. I mean, the, the bank's accounts are long as well, but and I've not gone all the way back, but um, 
so I, I restrict my comment to, to the relative degree of transparency between the bank's accounts and the Treasury's accounts. I don't know whether Nick wants to say something about the other, the, the other point that Robert makes in his, uh, in his question. I'd, I'd, I'd be very happy to, because Mario, being a loyal uh, civil servant, it's his job to explain government policy and, um, and upsetting the Bank of England, um, he's, he's, he, you know, is, is not in his job description. So I'd just like to say I completely agree with Robert Choate. Um, the, the, the bank effectively uh, taxes the banking system so it can, um, it, can, it can raise as much revenue as it wants. Now, actually, it's quite controlled and quite public spirited. And um, I've got a huge amount of time for uh, the people who run the bank and even more for its board, the court. Nevertheless, if you don't have a budget constraint, you will always tend to employ more people and pay them rather more uh, than organisations which do. And also, I think it's fair to say that the Bank of England comes out of a different tradition, you know, until it was nationalised by the Labour government in 1946. It was very much a private organisation with all the habits uh, of such an organisation. I can remember going, going, just having lunch with colleagues back in the... Um, in the 19, early 1990s, and uh, you know they lived a very different lifestyle. Um, good wine cellar. Um, Treasury obviously doesn't have a wine cellar, but um, I mean, but equally, it's also the Treasury's fault. Um, the Treasury tends to pay itself less uh, than other government departments, and then it's surprised that people tend to leave it. Um, it. And I have to say, I probably am one of, I'm one of the guilty men um, have occasionally delighted in the hair shirtism of Her Majesty's Treasury. And one of the strange things is that, um, and so Ed alluded to this, um, uh, the Treasury, when it's sort of ha ha handing out harsh medicine to other departments, always thinks it must treat itself even more harshly because this will increase its credibility. Um, but no politician I ever worked for was remotely interested in this. They said, look, you can fiddle the figures. Um, uh, you can show, you, you, you of all people should be able to demonstrate that the Treasury spending is on a downward path. But I want um, a strong Treasury with lots of people in it. And that was true of Gordon Brown. It was true of George Osborne. So, um, Anyway, sorry, I'm now beginning to um, drone on, but um, uh, in answer to Robert's question, yes, you're right. John, uh, I can just confirm. I can just confirm that Nick uh, McPherson held both of these views. Uh, he was always uh, concerned that, uh, that we, like George Osborne, wanted to increase the size of the Treasury, and he was always critical of the bank's profligacy even before he became the chairman of a private bank and therefore one of their direct paymasters. So um, the, his, his views predate his co-invested interest. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, another question from Christopher Hood. Uh, I'd like to ask about the administrative cost numbers. Are they gross or net? And did the proportion of admin costs accounted for by the PFI payments change over time? Uh, really good question, Christopher. Um, I can recommend the 2002-03 accounts for a good description of this. It's not one of the ones that is online, so you need to look for a printed copy. There is one in the Treasury. It'd be great to hear a bit from, from Ed about the decision to refurbish the building. I mean, in my when I started this project, I, th I thought, you know, what are the big things that are going to be in this period? And obviously I knew that earlier on the Treasury had decided to move from the, the, the sort of the east end of the building to the west end of the building. And that was a big PFI contract. I mean, in, in summary, Christopher, the PFI contract had three impacts. The, treasury, the accounts had to recognize a very large tangible fixed asset because the value of the building increased a lot when it was refurbished. Secondly, they had to recognize a big liability because of the obligation to pay the PFI contract over the 35 years. And because the liability was larger than the asset, that resulted in a one-off increase in operation costs, which is when I showed the chart 
of uh, admin costs, you saw a very large peak in 2002-03. Um, I've got all the references in the footnotes in the in the, the version that we're going to publish, but um, that's basically the answer on that. And on whether they're net of gross, all the admin costs that I've shown are net um, of all um, all uh, factors that have been netted off in each year. Um, that's it on that one. Thank you, uh, Nick. Nick, no, okay. Um, um, I mean, just I mean, on, look on the. I think the treasury was always going to be redeveloped by PFI because I can remember Ken Clark was um, very attracted by PFI in the mid 1990s. The, the only change I think which happened when Labour got in was that um, that we were going to be decanted into this uh, crumbly building next to where MI6 live. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say where MI6 live, but anyway, somewhere south of the river. And uh, Labour got in and concluded quite rightly that, it, that it, you know, they might be late for votes if they were stuck in a traffic jam south of the river. So, um, so the actual approach to PFI changed. I mean, on an optimistic note, I was always, you know, looking forward to the date when the PFI would be fully paid off, which I think is something like 2035. And that's actually getting, getting quite close. And at that point, the Treasury is going to have a bit of a windfall. Um, so um, don't spend it all at once, Mario. There's, um, as Nick says, there's, uh, there's no doubt that Gordon Brown saw it as a plot to decant the whole of the Treasury civil servants miles down the river. It's clearly a, an attempt to undermine his effectiveness and the effectiveness of the Treasury. So he soon put a stop to, uh, to that. Uh, but actually, the fact that Treasury never decanted was... Um, miles away was to everybody's benefit and the treasury ended up with a massively better building um, through a pfi process which had been championed by john major and ken clark and then by in particular sir andrew turnbull lord turnbull as permanent secretary and um i think andrew turnbull did a brilliant job but it was a substantial focus of his attention and uh, we were always and we were all very pleased with the outcome so um, all good. Well, that's lovely. We do have more questions coming through, but I'm conscious of the time and uh, uh, I think that we will finish it there. So um, I, I thought that was great. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, a, a big thank you as always to uh, Master of Ceremonies behind the scenes, Martin Stolliday. Uh, but apart from that, uh, Professor Balls, Professor McPherson, Professor Pisani, uh, I thought that, that was a tremendous presentation. This will be up online in the next days. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much.